Hey everyone, uh, I'm Adam Gardner. The, the session today is building progressive delivery and safety uh, into your applications with, with feature flags. So I'm assuming because you're in this room, most of you are app developers. Nod? Yeah, cool. Woo! Like that energy, nice. All right, but who am I? Um, I'm a DevRel, I work in the DevRel team, the developer relations team at Dynatrace. Getting some feedback now. Um, I'm also a CNCF and a CD Foundation ambassador. So I've spent the last decade or so in the observability space, obviously, being with, with Dynatrace, uh, but that encompasses a, a lot. It's, it's a wide field. Uh, so, quick show of hands, I know, nervous, uh, how many of you have heard the term progressive delivery? Good, good, about 20%, I would say, maybe not that. All right, so that, that's important, I mean, because different people have got different ideas, different open source projects will talk about it in different ways, the different vendors co-op that term to mean slightly different things. What do I mean for the... Uh, for the purposes of this talk, is any tactic, technique, or procedure, so any way, basically, that enables a software system, an application, a microservice, to be gradually enabled or disabled. So if you have a way to not go from version one 100% to version two, that's, that's all I'm talking about with, with progressive delivery, any, any strategy that, that enables that to happen. And really, that is a corollary for control and precision. Because if you've got that, you can control the rollout and the rollback, and you've got that precision to target who you're rolling out to. So how, how, how do you do that? A lot of it um, relies on duplication, basically. So you, you duplicate things and then you figure out a way to point people to, to this or, or that effectively. So reconfiguring, you know, even on VMs, reconfiguring load balancers, reconfiguring DNS, you know, this isn't cloud native especially. Uh, we've got blue green deployments where you spin up, you know, version A, version B, version one, version two, and you just send the traffic to the left or the right. Canary deployments where you're saying, well, you know, I'm on version one and I want to pick a subset of users that maybe they're in Australia, where I'm from, or maybe they have blue t-shirts on or, or whatever your criteria is. And you only send, you know, the new version to that set of, um, that set of users you obviously observe and you make sure that it's healthy and then you increase the size of that cohort. So over time, obviously, if you continue down that path, your version two becomes the primary version and you repeat the process. Client metadata strategies are, are another common way. Um, so here I'm talking about th leveraging things on the client side. And I don't just mean the browser, I mean any client. So, but things typically like header values, uh, like the user agent. So you might want to send Chrome users to a, a version and, and Firefox users to another version uh, using cookies, using geolocation, and, and pretty much any other aspect that you want that um, you, know, you, can, you can pick out and really choose how you're targeting uh, that, that cohort of users. And then you get more into the marketing type um, ways of doing things. So A-B testing, but also multivariate testing. So these days, you, know, you don't just have two variables. You've got hundreds of different capabilities and, 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 and things and, and combinations. And the marketing team love this because they're gonna to come to you and say, well, we're doing this new rollout, this new campaign, and actually we've got 10 versions of the page. We've got a, a button over on the left, a button on the right, and then two more versions where the button has different text. And then we've got a page with no button. And you not only have to code all of that, but then ultimately it's got to got to run and it's you, you've got to get the statistics about is it healthy is it working is it converting 
and so on and so forth. And then we've got feature flags. So all, everything else on this page is, you know, you can do, it might not be nice to do, but you could do it with duplication. And then kind of separately, we've got feature flagging. And obviously lots more of, lots more techniques. So at first glance, you might think, well, it's, it's this versus this. It's, it's the tooling aspect of using something like Flagger or Argo rollouts and any other tooling that you care to, to pick uh, or, or purchase. And then you've got feature flags. And they're, they're different. And I need to pick a road and stick with it. And, and, and you know, I'll, I'll hang my hat on that. But actually, um, it's not quite that simple because the tooling is great for big, broad, bold changes. So think about changing the uh, underlying container image, the, the version of uh, the JVM, the version of Python, you know, something that is big and actually logically you can't run two in the same container. It, it, it doesn't make sense. So the tooling aspect is great for that because you've got, phys not physical, but you, you get my point. You've got concrete duplicates where you can really com compare in, in the observability data, the statistics, well, is A or B, did it make any difference? Hopefully not. Hopefully it got quicker. Who knows? We'll see in the data. Feature flags are a little bit different. They have, uh, you can bolt on the tooling, by the way. So as app developers, you can write your code just like you have, and you just pass it to whoever runs it, and they provide all of the tooling. They provide the service meshes and the ingress rules and you know, the capability to send that uh, data from A to B. The feature flags you must develop in your application. So what that allows is actually, uh, if you hide your new features behind those flags, you, you can decouple your deployments, you know, the, the kind of act of getting that, that thing running from the releases, from actually um, you know, having users use the thing. Feature flags are great for small dynamic changes that uh, you might want to make. Um, and they're very, very good for looking at environmental conditions. As we saw before, things about the user, things about the client. So there are definite use cases for both. And if, if one of the things I want you to take away from this talk is that it isn't a versus, it's an and. So they, they, they can and should coexist and they work best when you, when you, when you use them and leverage them together. So going back to the tooling, this is how tooling, in this case, Flagger, this is how Flagger works. So on the top there, you've got your primary, that's version one. And then you're, let's say you're sending 100% of your traffic to version one because that's the only thing running. The tooling will then spin up the experimental version, the version two, the canary, we call it. And then Flagger, or you, or the DevOps people, or the SREs, will define the rules. So you say 10% of my traffic goes to the canary. I'm going to test it. It's healthy. OK, now I'm going to shift 20%, and so on and so forth. And that's what that, we all love YAML. Who, who doesn't love YAML? Uh, that, that's what Flux looks like. So, so uh, you're saying, well, every minute, we're going to check the health. And then we've got thresholds and weightings, and basically you're trying to get to 100%. So that's, that's what uh, you know, the, 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 the flux uh, looks like. And a similar thing with Argo, where we're saying, OK, each step, we're going to progressively roll out more and more traffic. And actually, we're going to wait a certain duration. So the first one, because there's no parameters there, uh, that's a manual wait. Someone actually has to go in and, and click go. But then after that, we wait 10 minutes. We progress to 60% of, of the split, 60% of our traffic. We wait 10 hours. And these are obviously arbitrary. Um, and then up to 80, we wait an hour. And at any point, if your metrics signal that that 
the canary, the new version, is unhealthy, you can trigger the rollback. Feature flags, though, just in case you're not um, you know, fully across what feature flags are and the use cases that they can really target, um, I've seen them used for feature toggles, obviously, as we're talking about testing and production. So if you can roll out whatever you like, as an app developer, if you can write your stuff behind a flag and say to people, don't worry, you can deploy because I know it's disabled, that's safety in itself. And actually, it, it allows you to do whatever you want because only when they're ready can you actually enable that feature. Kill switches, I've seen it used for uh, mitigating temporarily DNS, um, sorry, DDoS attacks. So we detect, we flick the flag, and all of a sudden you're being served from the CDN rather than the live, the live page. It's not the fix, of course, but it's, it's buying, buying your company some breathing, breathing room. User targeting, we've talked about. Uh, security mitigations. So if you're using a library and all of a sudden, you know, next week there's a vulnerability that, that appears in the world, if you can have a feature flag to toggle that functionality off or fall back to a different way of doing that thing, you're actually making your app more secure because the first thing you're going to be asked is, are we exposed? Yes. How often, uh, how quickly can we mitigate this? Well, instantly, just toggle, toggle the flag off. I don't know if you've heard, um, but large language models and chat GPT is uh, pretty big news these days, and I don't think you're expecting to get through this conference without hearing about it. So the other, there you go. I get the bingo if you haven't already heard this morning. Uh, structured content for LLMs. So, so they like content in a certain way so that they can you know, crunch it and do what they do, which no one understands. But you can serve the normal good-looking content to humans and then the other content, the stripped-down version, to the bots or Google bot or ChatGPT. Let's get some code. So this is what a feature flag looks like. You typically start your journey building something in-house. Um, this, very simple, is a get request on the home page. We're getting the flag value called foo, and then we're using that. So it's, it's the most basic feature flag you can have. It's effectively a Boolean. The problem here, though, is that get flag value, because that code there is you have had to write that, and that is the integration code that you're reaching out to your flag system, whether you've built it or bought it. So what you've actually done is you've tightly coupled, oh, shiver, we don't like that. You've tightly coupled your application to whatever flag backend you, you, you're using in-house or, or paid or an open source solution. So how do you solve that? Well, we rip that code out effectively. It's the same code, but we wrap it in an interface. We wrap it in an open feature provider and Basically, it's the same code, but open feature is a standard. It's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a standard that has a very well-defined interface. And so your connection code goes into an open feature provider. Pretty much the same code. But then you can just call get flag value. So what that actually looks like is you say, get me an open feature uh, API set the provider to, let's say you've built something in-house. That's that you would create the provider and that would be you setting that provider. And then as an app developer, you do that. You say open feature client, get me a Boolean, get me a string, get me a, you know, integer, whatever it is. You don't care day to day where that's coming from because there is a layer effectively in the middle. And so what you've really done is you've moved the padlock, the, 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 the integration back in the layer to the provider. So now your app is completely decoupled from the backend provider. At, at Dynatrace, for example, um, because we're assuming that everything's nice and you've got one feature flag system, but 
let's be honest, you don't. These things grow independently, and I think we've got six or seven different feature flag providers and vendors at Dynatrace. So, hence, we needed open feature. So the next question probably is, well, who creates or maintains these providers? Uh, obviously, if it's something you've developed in-house, it's you. If it's open source, then the open source community, the project will actually create that provider. So you don't even need to care how you're connecting to the backend. You just say, set the provider. If it's a paid vendor, of course, uh, and they are here at KubeCon, they will write the provider. Demo time, enough slides. Tell me the Wi-Fi hasn't died. Come on, get up. All right. anyone know a good joke? Come on. Yep, I will do. Okay, good, 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 good. Let's get it. Okay, increase the font size. So what you're looking at um, is a very, very basic demo. It's the open telemetry demo, the dice roller. So if you want to instrument things with open telemetry, you go on uh, their website and they've got this demo application that basically creates um, a number from one to six. I've instrumented it to send the open telemetry traces to Jaeger and I've also uh, feature flagged this so we can see the impact that, that feature flags can have. So um, there we are, we're running. Everything's nice and quick to regenerate my, my numbers. And if I go into Jaeger, we can see we have an open telemetry trace of the, the action. So looking at the, uh, the details, the, the, the span attributes on the trace, we can see the uh, feature flag provider. And I'm using an open source provider called FlagD. It's a, uh, you can run it in various ways, a Kubernetes operator, a standalone Linux binary. Uh, I think they've even working on in process evaluations now. But, uh, we have our feature flag key called slow your roll, and the value, the variant, is false at the moment. So there I'm saying I don't want to slow this down. So it's fast, it's 74 microseconds. So now, let's look at the flag definition. Is that big enough? No, no way. No, no, it doesn't like this. Okay, so this flag is called slow you roll, as we've seen from the trace. It's got two possible variants, on and off. As I say, this is the most basic version. Uh, and the default variant, so what everyone is getting right now, is off. So now if I just turn that to on, you'll notice we get the spinner. And it's slow. It does work, but it's slow. Going back into Jaeger, Now we've got a, a trace that's two seconds long, and again, drilling into that, we can see the slow your roll flag is true. 
So the real benefit to feature flags here is that I didn't need to restart anything, redeploy anything. It just happened at runtime because flag D is watching that file, that source of truth, and affecting my application at runtime. So that's what I mean. If you have a security issue, you can just toggle something and then, and then it just works, kind of. Let's make this a little bit more realistic and a little bit more advanced, though. So flag D and most feature flag vendors uh, give the option of targeting. So I'm going to reconfigure this flag, or redefine, I should say. If I can find the right tab. And what's happening now is it's still slow for me. But if ChatGPT came on this website and hit it, it would be fast for ChatGPT. Why? Well, because of the feature flag definition. So very similar. We've got uh, the same flag. It's still enabled. It's still got two possible variants. And the default variant is on this time. So by default, the website will be slow. But we've also got a targeting rule. Now, targeting rules, all of the feature flag vendors will, will do this. Uh, but this is how flag D implements, and it's JSON logic. So what I'm saying here is, well, if the user agent that I pass contains GPT bot, which is part of ChatGPT's user agent, then it's off. Otherwise, it's on, of course. So what you've done there is you've taken some of the logic that you would need to build in your code and put it outside. So now actually, as an app developer, that's one less thing for you to worry about because if, if the DevOps or the SREs need to redefine anything, they can do that as JSON logic. You, you've, you've shipped, your, you've done your job. You know, it's, it's up to them to decide who gets what versions. Well, the question then becomes, well, how, how did we get all of this stuff and how do we pass the, this contextual information? Am I only limited to user agent? Why, why user agent? Well, no, actually. So if I show you the code, So we start off by setting the provider, which by now you'll know is flag D. I'm running flag D as a, a, as a binary, so I'm passing it localhost on a, on a port. That's the only time I need to care about where my flags are coming from. Then in the actual code, I can say, here's a new evaluation context. And I'm going to pass the user agent, and I'm going to grab that from the request that comes in. And then when I evaluate the Boolean, or I ask open feature for the Boolean, I ask it for the key, the slow your roll, and I pass it the evaluation context that I've just built. And I just shove that off to flag D, and flag D can then do whatever it likes with the evaluation context. So this is the glue. This is how you get user or front end specific things into uh, your back end. So what if you wanted to change to a paid for vendor now? Well, the only bit you need to change are these three lines where you set the provider and you, you connect to a different back end provider because everything else is handled by open feature and because it is that standard, the vendors and the open source project are agreeing to, to, to give us back the data in the right format. And there we are. Uh, any questions? Do we have time for questions? Nope. I've waffled on enough. Well, thank you very much. Uh, come grab me. Um, the open feature booth will, uh, will, will be there. Uh, we're at open feature on the CNCF Slack channel and openfeature.dev. 
Very, very quickly, I've got four seconds left. The, to, the tool, tooling and flags are complementary. You can pick both. Open feature is future proof. So by doing that and by putting open feature in the middle, you're saving yourself work in the future. The wheel exists. Don't go and rewrite the feature flag engine. Use an open source project, buy a vendor, or use flag D to get started. As you've seen, the observability is essential because if you can't tell why one thing's slow and one thing's fast, you're kind of lost. And also, you know, ask the vendors about this. They provide the, the open feature providers, so, so ask them if they have a provider in, in the language that you code in. Thank you very much for your time.